Thanks, Les. Well, uh, first of all, thanks all of you for uh, coming in today and, and giving me the opportunity to talk to you briefly about uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, and specifically Allied Land Command, the only land command for the Alliance, uh, to give you a quick uh, update on where we are in uh, implementing NATO's transformation, which was agreed on at the Lisbon Summit. Uh, I'm also um, anxious to talk to you briefly about uh, what Russia is doing in the Ukraine and what NATO how NATO views that and what the alliance is doing to uh, assure our allies as well as deter uh, future uh, adversarial actions. Uh, I'd be happy to take the questions that you might have about the alliance. Uh, and also, uh, as an American officer, I'm a NATO commander, but I'm serving in NATO in that capacity, and I'd be uh, happy to talk about uh, why it's important for the United States to, to remain engaged uh, and provide leadership to the alliance. So that's a uh, range of things that I'm, that I'm happy to, to talk about and I look forward to your questions. I, I think it's important to remember that our alliance, uh, 65 years old, it's, it's evolved uh, as conditions have changed from what it first was created to do uh, after the end of World War II to now. It's grown to, it's grown to 28 nations. Uh, it's the most successful alliance in the history of the world. When you think of its membership, nations that fought each other for centuries have not fought each other for the last 65 years. Uh, certainly not perfect. Uh, we have many things to continue working on so that the Alliance remains able to live up to its Article 5 collective security uh, obligations, uh, but we are continuing to do that and there's plenty of evidence uh, that I'd be happy to talk about. It's also important uh, to keep in mind that the Alliance works hard at remaining relevant as the environment changes. The Lisbon Summit was all about making sure that the Alliance was going to be capable for life after ISAF, after the end of the ISAF mission in Afghanistan, what did NATO need to be able to do? And it obviously needed to be uh, sustainable. So uh, at Lisbon, the 28 nations agreed to reduce the size of the command structure by a half and about one third in terms of the number of positions. So a big cost savings to the nations. The end result is uh, a command structure that includes just one land command, that's us, we're based in Izmir, Turkey, one air command that's in Ramstein, Germany, uh, a maritime command that's in Northwood, the UK, and then the two joint force commands, of course, in Brunsum and Naples. We all report to the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, Secretary General Breedlove. It's a much flatter, much smaller NATO command structure, uh, which then means that the land forces of the alliance have to be more capable. And that's why our, our headquarters was created, to ensure that the land forces of the Alliance and the 20 member partner nations, excuse me, um, can be more effective and interoperable. So that's the reason for our headquarters, is to help make sure land forces of the Alliance and our partners are effective and interoperable. Uh, we're at a level of effectiveness and interoperability now better than it's ever been in the last 65 years because of what we've been doing together in Afghanistan. Uh, our headquarters has to make sure we don't lose that as we come out of Afghanistan. Uh, with respect to Russia uh, and Ukraine, uh, Russia's clearly acting like an adversary. Uh, their actions by the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea uh, and the destabilizing uh, activities uh, that they're conducting uh, on the, uh, off the eastern end of uh, Ukraine uh, clearly um, are uh, counter to uh, what we all uh, care about. Um, I think there's, you've heard from the, sec from the Secretary General and from the SACUR, uh, there's irrefutable evidence of what Russia is doing to support the uh, pro-separatists uh, in eastern Ukraine. Um, what our headquarters is doing in regards to this is of course assisting in the implementation of the assurance measures uh, that the Alliance agreed to to make sure that those nations who uh, are closest to um, potential threats, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, those nations that we're doing things to ensure, uh, to assure them that the rest of the alliance will live up to its Article 5 obligation. There is no doubt about that. No, we certainly will. I'll stop there and uh, look forward to your questions. As we move to the Q&A portion of the event, please state your name and publication for the transcript and uh, wait for the microphone, which could be coming from either side. Uh, please go ahead and ask a question.
Hi, I am Ani Sandu, U.S. correspondent for the Romanian Public Radio, and I would have two questions. First of all, considering Russia's actions in Ukraine, what kind of measures uh, did you take to prepare in case an Article 5 intervention is called upon? And second, some uh, countries in Eastern Europe have asked for permanent bases on their territory. Would you favor uh, the establishing of such a base in Romania or Poland? Uh, take the first one first. Of course, the alliance uh, has increased uh, the amount of aircraft that are involved uh, in the air policing uh, operations up in the Baltics, and they've also, uh, we have increased the number of aircraft who are doing air policing over the uh, Black Sea and in Eastern Europe. Uh, their maritime operations, maritime exercises in the Black Sea, uh, which, with which you'll be familiar, uh, Operation Breeze, the largest number of uh, NATO ships inside the Black Sea in, in, in quite some time, doing an exercise uh, off the coast of Romania and Bulgaria, all uh, within the norms of what's accepted uh, in the Black Sea in a, and also in accordance with the Montreux Convention. But uh, we're doing these things uh, to increase uh, readiness and, to, again, to assure the allies that are closest to that. The part that is uh, most relevant to our headquarters is the uh, use of exercises to improve interoperability and to demonstrate the capability of the alliance uh, that we will, in fact, be there should Romania or any other country in that area ever uh, be attacked or, or be threatened. The, uh, I know in Romania the presence of uh, Russian soldiers in Moldova, which has been there for quite some time, and the relationship between Moldova, Moldova and Romania is important. We watch that very closely. Uh, but Romania has a, a fantastic training area at a place called Cincu, uh, that uh, uh, American forces go to train there. We anticipate uh, British uh, uh, forces coming there in the fall also to participate uh, in exercises with Romanian forces. Um, the level of interoperability with Romanians is quite high, actually, because of the significant uh, contribution that Romania has made in Afghanistan. Um, I was just recently in Bucharest and at Cincu and also at Costanta at the other uh, base up there, M what's known as MK. So there is a, uh, a strong cooperation between Romania and the rest of the alliance, uh, good training facilities, and I would anticipate you'll, you would see an increase in, in training land forces as well as the other forces uh, inside Romania and Hungary and Bulgaria over the next several months. So that's that's the uh, uh, most important thing, I think, from a land perspective, is making sure that the, the land forces of the alliance are able to work uh, together. I don't think I didn't answer the second part. Would you say that second part again? So the second part was uh, some countries in uh, Eastern Europe, including mm -hmm. Romania, have asked for permanent bases on their territory. So would you favor uh, the establishing of such a base in Romania or Poland? And how long would it take, if the decision is made, how long would it take for such a base to be established? Well, I think um, the infrastructure that I alluded to was uh, done with uh, U.S. assistance, helping uh, Romanians develop their own infrastructure, their own capability. So there is a significant amount of uh, infrastructure available to do uh, good training. And also, you know, the, uh, the logistics base and airfield there near Costanta is an important hub for U.S. forces coming out of Afghanistan, working their way back. That's where they go through. So should it be required, there is uh, high-quality Romanian infrastructure that could be used to support increased uh, training exercises. Um, I think that uh, there's a uh, internal decision or national decisions that would have to be made by those Eastern European nations. Do they really want to have other uh, forces uh, living there. I'm not sure that that's that we know the answer to that yet, um, or that it's that it's necessary. What what I think is most important is that there is no doubt that the other members of the alliance will be there, should Romania be threatened. Hi, thank you for your presence here and for answering our questions. Marcus Pinder, German National Public Radio. Um, my first question is, um, does, the, does NATO have any kind of role in training or assisting the Ukrainian uh, military forces? 
And could you elaborate? If so, could you elaborate on that? And secondly, you mentioned, uh, actually it was central to what you said, interoperability was very important and was better than ever. Could you uh, elaborate on that and name a few uh, elements of interoperability that could have improved and that could further be improved, maybe? Okay. No, I'd be glad to. Um, first, congratulations to uh, Germany. Oh, Weltmeisterschaft. I'm very proud of the United States. I think well, we stayed closer to you than Brazil did, so uh, um, we're very, very proud of that. But congratulations. Um, with uh, Ukraine, their, their uh, training and operations with Ukrainian forces has actually been going on for quite some time. You know, we had uh, Ukrainian soldiers that were part of the uh, operations in Iraq. Uh, they were under uh, uh, Multinational Division Center South. So we've been working with the Ukrainians for at least the last 10 or 11 years there, beginning in Iraq. We had Ukrainian uh, personnel uh, operating in Afghanistan. Uh, and there's also, uh, there's been a, an exercise series. It's a multinational exercise co-hosted by Ukraine and uh, the United States called Rapid Trident. It takes place each year in uh, Lviv. So uh, in fact, I was there last year watching the exercise and it's scheduled again this year to take place in uh, mid-September. So that, this is an exercise that goes on routinely. Uh, I don't want to oversell it in terms of um, you know, the interoperability is perfect yet, but the, but the purpose of these exercises is to try and make sure we retain the professionalism, the capabilities of Ukrainian armed forces, an important PFP, Partnership for Peace uh, nation in association with the Alliance to assist in the development of their armed forces. Now when you talk about interoperability, I think there are two pillars of interoperability. The first pillar has to do with common standards and procedures, and NATO has a fairly well documented and uh, developed set of standards for how to do things, procedures in headquarters, operations, almost everything you can imagine uh, that already exists. So everybody's got to be able to, to follow those standards, which requires knowing what they are and practicing and training. The second pillar of interoperability, I believe, is communications. Uh, in, in NATO speak, we would say CIS, uh, communications and information systems. All of your computers, your uh, co battle command systems, the screens that track information, all this stuff has got to be interoperable. Um, the standards part, I think we're actually in pretty good shape because of the operations in Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, and the Balkans. It's generally well known. The, uh, the, frankly, the European members of the alliance know the standards better than the Americans uh, do. Um, so we're pretty good there. Uh, the bigger challenge is on CIS, the communications and information systems, because each nation is going to protect its own defense industry, so the nations will buy different systems. And really, that's okay. I, I don't care what the, the label is on the box, whether it's Talus, Fin Mechanica, Raytheon, whatever. What I care about is, do the electrons, you know, the information, the digits, do they, do they match up? So when you have an Estonian battalion under a, an American brigade that's under a German division that's under a French corps, can they communicate? And that's hard. Technically, it's not hard. You could probably get three teenagers together and, and they could figure out the technical part. It's the authorities and policies um, that need to be uh, addressed to allow that. So we've got a little bit of a mismatch between strategic vision and expectations on interoperability and at the lower level, actual implementing policies because people are worried about information sharing, um, who has access to databases and so on. Um, so we've got some work to do there. Yeah, hello. My name is Jens Schmitz. I work for Badische Zeitung and five other German newspapers. Uh, my question is about Germany. The first one, at least, I have two. Um, last week, the former vice chairman on the National Intelligence Council, Mark Löwenthal, was in the PBS News Hour. And he said, uh, and I quote here, in the view of a lot of senior American officials, they, meaning the Germans, are not alliance worthy. And he also, that was his translation of Bündnis Fähig. Is that a feeling that you have encountered in the military community as well? And either way, I think it should affect either your 
cooperation with the Germans or with, um, with the intelligence community in the US. That would be my first question. And the second one on a more broader note is um, there's a guideline for the financial commitment that each country should make and most European countries don't meet it. Um, Germany is lagging far behind, I think. Is that, um, how big of, an, of a topic is that within your daily operations? Thank you. Okay, no, thanks. Uh, first, I've never heard anybody ever even hint or suggest or opine that somehow Germany is not alliance worthy. That's, that's a ridiculous assertion. Uh, it's been an essential, very strong uh, member of the alliance for a long time. Third largest troop contributing nation in Afghanistan, up in RC North with 5,000 soldiers at the peak, uh, which dwarfed uh, the input of a lot of others. Uh, the, the quality of officers and non-commissioned officers um, that Germany provides in my headquarters, uh, as well as in other parts of the command structure, you know, they're as good as anybody there is, very professional, obviously very good equipment. Uh, they've, uh, Germany has uh, improved its training facilities there in Germany, uh, both at Wildflecken and at, uh, in um, south of Berlin, which is a new maneuver training center uh, modeled after the, uh, the American one, when, which is at Hohenfels. I mean, so Germany has invested in those facilities. Um, and the quality of people that they provide to the alliance from you know, German four-star generals like uh, General Hans Lothar Dummerza, the commander of Joint Force Command Brunsum, or General uh, Werner Freers, the chief of staff at SHAPE, who's my classmate from the War College, by the way. Uh, these are exceptional officers. Should Germany do more? Do I wish they would do more? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you've got that sort of quality. Um, I would like to see uh, more capacity. Um, and I would also like to see Germany be more involved uh, in international exercises um, to what I see them doing inside Germany in German training areas, I'd like to see them be more involved in, the, in, the, in those. I, but those are internal decisions. But the, obviously the reason I'd want to see it is because of the quality that they bring. And my sense is that, that they're moving in that direction now. Um, to the 2% uh, standard for percentage of GDP, I think that's a, a good standard. It's a reasonable standard. Uh, and more nations ought to get a whole lot closer to it. Having said that, um, I think it is uh, important to put in context, in context that there are other things about being an, uh, being an ally uh, that are also very important. Um, access, you know, for the United States, uh, the, de the decision to reduce its footprint overseas, particularly in Europe, um, significant reduction uh, is based on a premise that the U.S. will have access to airfields, ports, capabilities in Europe to be able to project power. Uh, we cannot take for granted that Germany or Italy or Spain or Turkey will allow U.S. forces just to kind of move in and out of there or that great base in Romania. Um, so the granting of access, uh, overflight, things like that, sharing of information and intelligence, those are very, very important parts of the uh, alliance. Uh, to be candid, I, I think that uh, uh, a nation that uh, has uh, economically strong as Germany has a leadership obligation. Uh, I think that they clearly, uh, what uh, Germany has done, uh, let, me, let me restate it. Germany, Italy, and others um, have significantly strong ties to Russia, economic ties that go way back. In fact, every nation in the alliance, including my own nation, has economic, has business with Russia, uh, some much more than others. Uh, despite that, all 28 nations have continued to uh, stick together on the implementation of assurance measures, on the implementation of uh, leverage, sanctions on uh, advisors, friends, leaders in Russia, so there, there are other parts about being a, a good ally in addition to uh, are you spending enough? And frankly, I would, I would, I'm just as concerned about what are you spending it on versus just the act of spending. Uh, communication systems that are interoperable, um, modernizing uh, aircraft, uh, having logistical capability, those kind of things. You know, how you spend the money uh, is very important. 
Okay. Uh, to follow up with my uh, German colleague, uh, how do you uh, see uh, the role of France in, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Claude Porcella from Radio France International. Uh, how do you see the role of France since France has rejoined the military uh, command? Uh, as you know, France is decreasing its military budget, so uh, that's not going to be very helpful as far as the two person is concerned. But uh, usually speaking, uh, what France role is is uh, is playing in in NATO now? Well, uh, sure. Since since France uh, re-entered the integrated command structure, uh, they're back in a in a very serious way. Of course, uh, General Palmero is the commander of uh, Strategic Allied Command uh, Transformation, which is headquartered in Virginia. So he's one of the two four-star strategic commanders, General Breedlove, of course, at, at SHAPE, um, is, is his counterpart. So you've got an extremely uh, high-ranking position there. And then we've got the uh, vice chief of staff at SHAPE is a three-star Lieutenant General Philippe Stoltz, uh, French general officer in an extremely influential, important position. In fact, he's probably the one person at SHAPE that I interact with the most. Uh, he's our biggest champion there, uh, understands and appreciates the importance of land power as part of what the alliance overall does. So. Um, uh, and then you've got senior French officers throughout all the other headquarters. France is the uh, third largest contributor in my headquarters. Ten percent of the headquarters are, are French positions. So that's a, that's a, a uh, commitment by France to uh, uh, be back in the alliance. Uh, and my senior French officer is, is my chief of plans, an exceptionally talented officer. Uh, and he does one of the most important functions that we have in the headquarters. So at the individual level, those are some examples of where France is fully engaged in what's going on. Uh, we have all uh, been impressed with how French uh, forces operated in Mali, uh, the way they've done that. And also, the, you know, they didn't do that alone. You, you had a coalition, including U.S., Canada, other nations that supported uh, their operations there um, that I think are a, a very positive sign. France contributes in, in other ways that are very important. In fact, today, the land component of the NATO response force is the French Rapid Reaction Corps that's based in Lille. So it's one of the nine core headquarters that make up what's known as the NATO force structure. Um, it's a multinational headquarters, but the framework nation is, is France. Uh, General, Lieutenant General Eric Margai is the commander. Uh, it's been there about a year. So if NATO were to use the NATO response force, the NRF, then the lead headquarters um, on the land would be the French-based French Rapid Reaction Corps. That's, an, that's a very important uh, contribution. Um, the, uh, so in terms of being an important, viable member of the Alliance, of course I'd like to see them continue to uh, maintain capacity to help deal with all the uh, different um, requirements. Uh, but in terms of quality, they're as good as anybody else in the Alliance. Other questions? Hi, I'm Ann Walters. I'm with the German Press Agency, DPA. Um, as the mission in Afghanistan winds down, how would you um, uh, say that the role of NATO should continue? How would you convince people in in the member countries of the ongoing importance of NATO um, as the ISAF mission winds down? Importance of NATO with regards to Afghanistan? Yeah. Well, I think the, the nations have already shown how important that they value this because there's no shortage of people volunteering to, or nations um, stepping up to uh, fulfill requirements for the RSM, Resolute Support Mission, which is the follow-on. Um, so I, I think that uh, you think of the challenges associated with Afghanistan, um, that's impressive to me that so many nations continue to stay willing uh, to invest uh, and, and do their part all the way up to the end. Uh, certainly, uh, I think we're all happy and, and proud to see what Secretary Kerry has done and, and along with other nations helping to uh, get the, uh, the two candidates to, to agree to an outcome. Um, but that, and that was very important. Uh, nations were waiting to see that. And I think the, uh, 
the unity, the nation sticking together on that was an important part of Secretary Kerry being able to uh, help them achieve that outcome. Uh, so I, I think the uh, the nations recognize, you know, the, the transition is the right transition. Um, the, the training and preparation that's being done, the leadership that's being put into place to make that transition from ISAF to resolute support, um, very professional, solid, and um, I, I don't think that, uh, I don't think you're gonna see NATO members slipping away from that prematurely. Hi, I'm uh, uh, Lauri Tankler with the Estonian Public Broadcasting. I just want to follow up the French question uh, um, about uh, about the military and the NATO. Uh, how do you, as a, as an officer and as a military leader, how do you see the the French government decision to sell the Mistral warships to Russia and to train their uh, train the the Russian troops there? Well. Um of course, that's a each, each nation in an alliance. Each nation um, can uh, make the decisions, um, make can make sovereign decisions. Um, to the average person on the outside, it's a little bit difficult to uh, understand. Hey, uh, understand that. Uh, but I, I saw where the French Minister of Defense yesterday talked about within the EU that there are different levels of uh, measures that could be taken as part of a sanctions regime and that um, so far that the EU had not yet reached that third level which would have um, obligated France not to, um, not to sell, to, to complete the, uh, the sale of those ships to Russia. So I think, and I'm certainly not the expert on this, uh, but it seems to me that inside France, you know, they're looking at EU rules for sanctions that, uh, that the EU is not there yet. And, and so they, are, they will continue to, along that path. Thank you. Um, I'd like to come back to Ukraine once more. Um, you've mentioned the transformation that NATO is in and the different strategic uh, concept. And I was just wondering, um, I think uh, one of the reasons for that was obviously like the budget constraints. Another one was the realization that um, adversaries might be different in the future than they used to be. But now with the Ukraine crisis and the realization that Russia is, is back as an adversary in a way, at least, um, I was just wondering, did that cause any rethinking on, on NATO's part? Is, have there been any changes made to the new strategy or will you just proceed as you planned? Well, I think the, uh, there's, there's a couple of ways to, to look at this. First of all, um, I think a lot of people who have watched Russia over the years, you know, are, um, are seeing that Russia is what we always thought they were. Um, that this notion that somehow they could be this, um, you know, wonderful partner like some other uh, European country was probably not well founded. Absolutely, we need to maintain a cooperative relationship with Russia. All the nations do for not just economic reasons or humanitarian reasons, but it's an extremely important country with a uh, powerful military and potentially uh, powerful uh, economy, so there's a hundred good reasons f to have a, a good relationship with the Russians, not just to prevent uh, conflict from breaking out. But the fact is, regardless of what the, regardless of what type of government it was, whether it was Tsarist Russia, Communist Russia, post-Soviet um, era, uh, and now under President Putin, you know, use of force, uh, their own interpretation of a lot of the legal instruments that are out there in, in international uh, domain. Uh, using those things, information, uh, to achieve what it is that they want to achieve. So I think uh, what's happened in the last few months has uh, kind of reminded people of that. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody's rushing to, uh, to reestablish armaments industries and, and start rearming necessarily. In fact, very few nations have uh, indicated that they're going to increase defense spending. Um, but we will, uh, we're, we are going to do one thing that the Secretary General and the SACUR said that we're going to do, even before this started, in the life after ISAF, is that you're going to see more robust uh, exercises, because only through exercising can you retain interoperability 
uh, and by exercising in those Eastern European nations, can you demonstrate assurance and capability that we can get there and that we will be there? And then, frankly, I think that's also, by demonstrating that capability, that's, you know, that has a deterrent effect that's important. I think that, uh, I think Russia believes that they probably have seven or eight weeks to do something. I don't mean seven, or eight, seven weeks from today, I mean in general, their planning horizon. I think they probably think they have seven or eight weeks to do something uh, before the alliance could actually respond to it. And uh, you know, they don't act like a chess player, they act like a checkers player, and they, they see an opportunity, they'll do it. Um, I think the, uh, there's a notion of creeping normalcy, which means that they do something, and if the West doesn't react to it, that, that becomes a new norm. I mean, it clearly is the policy of uh, the, the nations of NATO that Crimea belongs to Ukraine. But candidly, you don't hear a lot of discussion about how we're, what we're going to do to help restore it to Ukraine. Um, so it's almost like the boundary has been changed, and now territorial waters in the Black Sea potentially are changed. You know, will that be recognized by international courts, uh, shipping insurance? You know, all the, those kind of things is, is yet to be seen. I, I hope not, um, because Crimea is sovereign territory of Ukraine, and uh, uh, it'll be a political solution to restore that. Can I follow up on that? Um, on the Ukraine, I asked this, uh, the question before, and you said that um, there's a, a history of um, interoperation um, with the Ukrainian military. Did anything change from the begin beginning of that crisis uh, in, in, in April until now? I mean, is there new input from NATO into the Ukrainian uh, training uh, of forces, or is there new hardware that is being sent to the Ukraine? Is there any anything that has changed since April? Um, I am personally not aware of specific uh, things that have been provided by any nation. Uh, what I have seen is a, a determination to continue with the, the rapid trident exercise in September, which I think is important. I think we've had a couple of nations that want to join the exercise uh, that maybe weren't on it before. Now, this is not a gigantic exercise. It's, you know, just a, a very few thousand soldiers would be involved. Uh, obviously, it, it, I think it sends a powerful signal um, if we do it. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, of course, Ukraine, I mean, they're the host. Uh, and they are very busy right now. It was, the exercise was originally, was originally going to be in August, uh, and they, excuse me, in July and they asked to shift it to September because to do this exercise and conduct the operations that they were doing at the time would, would not have been feasible. Um, I hope that we're able to conduct this exercise in September because we want to see them continue to help them improve their capability, which is something we would be doing regardless of whether or not Russia had ever gone into Crimea. This is a normal part of the very robust partnership program that the Alliance has with 20-something different nations um, to help partner nations uh, to continue to improve their capability. Uh, as I mentioned, Ukraine has been part of operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, other places. So we need them, again, separate from whether or not Russia ever went into Crimea, uh, we need them to be able to operate inside multinational formations because they're so dependable about going to places to do stability operations or, or otherwise.